Hello everyone, it is I, Dungeon Master Dave, and I am back. And this week we are going to continue our discussion on building your own custom homebrew setting. Now, I had a problem a few weeks back where everything was just going wrong with my stream. Um, it's quite terrible. I mean, there wasn't a picture in the background, nobody could see what was going on. Um, I couldn't fix it took me a few hours, so I kind of did a workaround, and I'm hoping it works for you folks now, and you can see it at home, and we're going to just pick up the discussion where we left off last time. Actually, not where we left off. We're going to restart it, um, and I'm going to be talking about what type of races do you want your players to have access to, and there's several ways to go about this. Um, now, one of the first ways is to look uh, and Possibly the traditional fantasy route is tend, tends to be the most popular, one that most people are familiar with, and the one that most people are going to gravitate towards. This will probably give you your largest audience base, would be traditional fantasy. And by traditional fantasy, I mean that you're going to have your humans, elves, dwarves, orcs, goblins, depending on you know uh, which side of the spectrum you want your players to be able to access character races from. And... Um, Dungeons and Dragons does a very good job of bringing traditional fantasy to the table. Other games have as well, you know, such as EverQuest, um, World of Warcraft, but they've also added kind of like their own little twist with uh, character options. Some of them might add the option to also be like trolls or ogres or special kind of elves. Um, really, really, uh, it's really dependent on the setting. Um, another option you may choose: human only. Kind of like the world we live in. You know, there are no other races. Humans are the only people that you can choose from. And that one can be very... What am I thinking? Uh, well, very familiar for the player. Because they are human. They know what it's like to be human. And they can identify with the character easier. You know, this is, uh, I'd say, probably a good option for people who might not be too sure about role playing and you know they might not get the idea of like okay well how do i be an elf or how do i be a dwarf human might stick with uh i'd say good for beginners um it's also a very decent uh setting choice for you know for characters it, we're all very familiar with it we are humans so it's something we're very familiar with and then there's traditional fantasy non-human. This one, again, is just like the traditional fantasy I spoke of earlier, but no humans whatsoever. Uh, you'll have your elves, your dwarves, you know, your gnomes, your orcs, your goblins, but humans don't exist. They might have never existed. And uh, this is where you can, you know, you can kind of explore, you know, the other races that fantasy has to offer. You can decide, all right, you know, I want to be an elf or I want to be a dwarf. You don't have the like the full options of traditional fantasy where humans are prevalent and you don't have the restriction of human only. This one is it's pure fantasy and you can just run wild with it. And then of course, there's a, a fourth option, outworldly. And with this one here, there are so many options, almost like infinite possibilities. You could come up with your own custom races, of course. Um, they might fit the traditional fantasy role, you know, like bipedal humanoids, you know, two arms, two legs, or even like centaur-like beasts. Or it can be something that's more, sm you know, smaller and more niche. Uh, like, for example, you could be like a bacon person with laser eyes or a sentient bottle of water. Just something totally out of this world or maybe jelly blob people you know like aliens so this one has the largest potential um is it my personal favorite no my personal favorite i do like traditional fantasy not saying the other ones are bad it's just i personally like traditional fantasy that's what i would use while building a setting and uh that's what i'm going to use but outworldly works for some people, but you're really going to limit your target audience on that one. Um, it might even stem from like inside jokes, so it might only work with you and your friends. 
or it might work for a small group of players that are into that. And by a small group, I don't mean like, you know, a handful. Uh, it might be a few hundred, a few thousand. It really depends on, um, you know, how many people are in to what uh, what's available to them in the outworldly setting through the, through the race options and such. Um, attritional fantasy is probably the largest base where you find most player access. You know, most players will gravitate towards that. They'll uh, be easy for them to pick up, like, oh, you know, I could be an elf, I could be a dwarf, yeah, I could be a cat person, I could be a dog person, I could be a bird person. Um, human only, probably, I'd say, decent amount, but since it's very limiting, probably not much more than outworldly, you know, for the, for the player base, and then traditional fantasy non-human. That one's hard to pinpoint, but probably... Uh, just under traditional fantasy, I'd say, with the you know the amount of people that might want to play in that type of setting. And when you're uh, considering your races for your setting, um, and let's say you are going with like the traditional ones, like elves and dwarves and stuff, did you want to draw like upon familiar uh, stereotypes and tropes that you've seen in like movies and comics and video games, or did you kind of want to make your own? You know, um, there's always a decent, uh, wow, sorry, I had a little brain fart. It's, it might not be a bad idea to draw upon something familiar, but you might want to want to draw on something too familiar, because then it just becomes another vanilla cookie cutter setting, you know? So maybe you give your elves the pointy ears and the angular features so people kind of recognize what they look like. But do you want them to be all nature-like and woodland beings? Or did you want to change it up a little? Maybe they're the most technologically advanced race that you have. Or maybe they're not. Maybe they're like the most untechnological. Maybe they're like cave people, you know, the dwarves. Uh, sure, you might want them to be shout, short and stubby and stout, you know. Do they have to be grumpy? Who knows? Maybe they're cheerful. Maybe they like to uh, sing, kind of like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, where they're always happy and jolly. Are they all miners, though? Are they always going down in the mines? Or are these, like, dwarves that might live underwater? And I don't mean, like, mer people. you know? They have, like, I don't know, submarines or something, and they have these underground, not underground, but underwater uh, cities that are kind of separated, you know, with, like, a dome. Just... What's, uh, what's going to make your race stand out, you know, or your racial, racial options stand out, if, if, if that's what you're going for at all. You don't have to go for that, but it might be something to kind of attract the players to your setting, like, hey, I do have elves, and this is the lure of the elves in my world, or I don't have elves, I have pig people, and they are the most prevalent race, and this is their lore, and this is how they've come about, and this is how they present themselves in my world, and this is how they get along with the other people, which are the uh, the bird people, or the dog people, you know? You gotta figure out how they fit into your setting, and how they interact with the world around them, and what they do. And when coming up with your race as well, you might want to consider what features will it have. And there are many different ways for features. Like, for example, genetic features. For elves, it would be ears. Dwarves, short and stout. Orcs might be tusks. You know, those are things that you can physically see on the, uh, the creature itself, on the being. You know, that will, that will tell you that is an elf, that's a dwarf, that's an orc. You know, that is a cat person, the, uh, the genetics of the creature. And sometimes genetics um, aren't always on the outside either. Like, you know, maybe the creature has a bigger brain or two hearts or four stomachs or uh, its eyes are really good. So that's something else to consider when you're making these features. Are they mechanical or are they purely aesthetic? How do I get my little indentation again? Boom, there we go. So then for genetic, you put mechanical or aesthetic. 
Did I spell that right? Ah, oh, crap, I don't know if I did. <laughs> Aesthetic. We'll pretend I spelt that right. And then there are also circumstantial features. You're probably wondering, what is a circumstantial feature? Well, was this race cursed long ago by some evil wizard or god or demon or witch that somehow puts a mark upon it that gives it an innate feature or an innate ability or something that separates it or kind of makes it special or just does something for it? Those would most likely be mechanical. You know, the cir uh, any circumstantial feature. Or maybe something happened to the race. Maybe something tragic, like where they got locked underground. Kind of like the story of the uh, the drow in Celtic in Norse mythology. You know, the dark elf. They got locked underground. Uh, and you find it also in Dungeons and Dragons. They were, some great war happened. They got forced underground, and then through the millennia, they've kind of warped, twisted, and changed into what is known as the Drow. Um, so that would be an example of a circumstantial list of features. You know, they have the dark vision, they have greater dark vision because of it, but also at the same time, they uh, their eyesight burns in bright light. You know, so things like that. So this would be purely, I'd feel, mechanical. Purely mechanical. Uh, at the same time, how did the circumstance change them? How does the circumstance benefit them? What is the drawback? See, those are things to consider. Like, is there a drawback? There doesn't necessarily have to be. And, yep, see, this is where I get into the, uh, the features, the physical. So before I described, you know, like, we'll put ears, nose, eyes, height, weight, build, um, appendages, shapes. shapes of the, uh, the character there, like, you know, when, when, when you picture a dwarf, right, the shape you kind of come out was like a square, you know what I mean? Because they're short, and they're stout, and they're compressed, and it's, it's a physical feature that they have, they're like a little box that kind of like moves forward, and they're like a miniature little battle tank, you know, when you, when you, when you picture an elf, you picture an, you know, a nice lithe rectangle, you know, and they have triangular ears. So these are all things to consider, you know, the physical in appearance. Um, sometimes the hair color, eye color, skin color. What if you have plant people? They may have green skin, right? You know, they'd have like the photosynthesis and stuff like that. Their skin would be green. Be able to like uh, make chlorophyll. They'd be able to eat from the sun because it would be giving them energy. So that's a physical f features that you might see on the character. Now. What about internal? This is what I was talking about earlier, too. So maybe they have extra organs or are missing organs. Or maybe they have uh, new organs, you know, ones that, like, don't exist in our own bodies. So those are things to consider, too. Or maybe they have innate magic or abilities. Just think of a spider person, right? Like, let's say they're kind of humanoid like us, but they have some features of a spider. Like, instead of, you know, uh, a normal mouth, they have these little mandibles that just come out and pull food in or something like that. Or out of their anus shoots webs. Or their tongue maybe drips venom or poison, you know? Those are going to be some example of the uh, internal, like what's inside, what's going to change it. Um, like I said before, two hearts. Maybe creatures got two hearts, one on each side, and that uh, makes them stronger, makes them more sturdy. You know, like you know how you have two lungs, you can live without one lung, but it kind of sucks. Well, maybe this creature can live with only one heart. You know, but it, maybe it kind of sucks for it. But hey, it happens. So if they get shot in the heart, it's not like 
they're dead, you know, they, they, they live because they have two. Uh, those are things to consider, you know, traditional fantasy creatures, um, and they usually model the human existence. Um, I think that was probably one of the big romanticisms uh, for the culture was to embody these other creatures that are similar to humans but have differences. So when the, uh, the old Celts were coming up with their mythology and not coming up, but you know, the stories are being passed down and they're like, oh, this is an elf. It's easier for everyone to envision when it's very human-like, you know, when it looks like a human, but it has subtle differences. People can put that in their mind easier than if you're describing something that someone's not too familiar with, then it, uh, it might be, it might lose its translation, you know, when, you, when you're trying to describe it. I mean, now we have pictures and stuff. You can have an artist, they can draw it out, and you can be like, all right, that, that you know, that, that's a decoit. You know, like, see, it's got blue skin and webbed fingers and hair on its back, and it shoots quills from its hands. Uh, you know, with artists, it's a little bit easier, but you got to think of the time before, you know, there had prevalent artists. I mean, not saying people didn't do art, but I, they didn't have the, the permanent means we had, I felt, especially... In their society they might have technology available to them they might have painted it on something and a little less permanent uh, scratched it on something I feel like a lot of it was oral tradition passed down so it's easier to, to realize something that is human in nature whether it's a short stout human that lives in caves or whether it's the uh, immortal elves that lived in the trees or the other ones they had the dark elves that lived underground that were the evil counterpart because the elves in Celtic mythology came in two versions. There was the light elves, which were like these immortal good beings that embodied everything that was good. But I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they had kind of like a little uh, trickster side to them. You know, they were like very. Uh, my brain is a little off at the moment. Um, normally I would know this word, but right now I'm kind of like slipping on it. But you know what I mean? Like, uh, fairies are, are that way too. Goblins, you know, in, in the old mythology. Um, they like to play pranks, they like to play tricks. There's a word for it. I can't think of it. It's funny because I swear as soon as I turn this off and I stop doing this, I'll know the word. I'll say it to myself and I'm like, of course, that was the word. Wow, how did I forget that? But anyway, I'm, I'm harping too much on that word and I'm like getting to the point. Uh, but you got to look at certain, let's look at certain settings, like Lord of the Rings, for example, um, where Tolkien drew heavily from the old Celtic mythology, and, you know, he brought the embodiment of elves to life in his world, dwarves to life, orcs, um, goblins and such, and that is where most traditional fantasy these days kind of draws its images for these, is from Tolkien's, Tolkien's books that he wrote, that he got from the mythology of the Celts and now Dungeons and Dragons has kind of adopted that and expanded on upon it and their mythology that they cover is a little bit wider but uh, most of the traditional fantasy races that they have will originate from the Celtic mythology you know you have dwarves gnomes elves um, mm, trying to think I mean some other things, you know, might be their own invention, but they draw on that. Other settings that might change it up a little, Dragonlance, they have elves, dwarves. Uh, their little halfling creature is Kender, which is kind of, I guess, like a halfling elf mix. Not literally like a hybrid, but, you know, it's got like elf-like ears. It's got the slender body, but it's very small. Um, Dark Sun, they have half giants. I believe they have a psychic race of bug, if I'm not thinking. Is it three green? I could be wrong. Uh, I've never delved too much into Dark Sun, so I can't be 100%. Uh, Forgotten Realms is like the mismatch of everything, you know. They want to they wanna be super accessible to everyone. It's understandable because that is Wizards of the Coast's uh, prime setting. So they want to make as much available to people as possible to get a wider audience and fan base in there. Um, Eberron has your traditional, like, you know, your races, plus they add Warforged which is like the mechanical golem-like people. Uh, or it's like kind of like a soul that's been transported to a machine. Think, I believe, uh, what was that show? Full Metal Alchemist. And his name is 
Elric? Is Elric the mechanical little boy? Right? He's the big giant suit of armor with the soul inside. Think of that. It's kind of like a warforged, you know? The soul was transferred to another body. Uh, most of the time, though, I feel like a warforged, they don't remember their past life before this body. Um, there might be cases where some do, but if I'm not mistaken, I believe they just don't remember it whatsoever. Uh, mischievous was the word I was thinking of. Yes, mischievous. <laughs> uh, it's a good thing I thought of it and I remembered it before the stream was over. Uh, so yeah, so those are going to be some things to consider while implementing your character races into the game. And now you have your setting. So when you consider your setting, what type of setting do they live in? We went over this last time, right? We went over through all these. What type of character races would you like in that setting? What do you feel would fit? What do you feel would try to accomplish what you're trying to do with the setting? And I think that's how you can go about your selection. So I myself, um, like I said, I'm a fan of the traditional fantasy. I like it. Um, so let me actually go and talk about some of the races I'll be introducing in traditional fantasy or in my setting. So Dungeon Master... Oh, wait, I need another space. We'll call me Dungeon Master Dave. Uh, if there's any other Dungeon Master Daves out there, no relation, totally coincidental. Uh, my name is Dave, and I'm a Dungeon Master, and it's easy to call me Dungeon Master Dave, and it's only through these streams. So don't take offense if you also happen to be a Dungeon Master Dave. In fact, we should unite and become a bunch of Dungeon Master Daves together and have one big Dungeon Master Fest where we each kind of you know what? I'm getting off topic. Don't worry about it. So anyway, Dungeon Master Dave's Brewery of Races. And these are the kind of the ones that I am going to implement into my setting. I kind of like to give the players a decent amount of choices. Um, but I don't want to give an overwhelming amount. I don't want to be at the level of Forgotten Realms, you know, there's like so many, but I also don't want to be small where there's only a handful. I don't know. Ooh, one more thing I forgot to mention about races is past games have had something they call sub race. And what it is, it's kind of like a little division between the races like that make them different. Think of a dog, right? And you have German Shepherds, Doberman Pinschers. Uh, it, it'd be like more like a species within the race, you know, um, Rottweilers, things like that. So, for example, the elves, they have three main kinds and other settings have other kinds. But there's the high, the dark and the wild. The wild elves, they live in the woods and they're like your traditional uh, tribe, you know, tribal member. Most people see them akin to like Native Americans, but you can pretty much uh, relate them to maybe anywhere there's like tribes you know in the in the world they tend to uh, be hunter gatherers um, they use very primitive weapons um, they don't you know their armor is not very advanced they might just use the skins of animals for their armor and things like that uh, then there's the high elves they're supposed to be like your most uh, what was I gonna say Wow see the brain farts there they are again your elves that are most uh, awoken, you know, they're supposed to be very, I don't know, in tune with nature, but at the same time, they're supposed to be like the ones that like you seek for guidance and they have these grand, wonderful kingdoms. Like, for example, uh, if you ever watch the Lord of the Rings movie, um, you know, when they go to Elrond's there, those are supposed to be like the high elves, you know, they're like, oh, wow, look at them. Those are the high elves. Look at their kingdom. They, they live inside. They made, you know their kingdom here uh, within the waterfall, the rocks and everything, and they don't really disrupt nature too much, but they're definitely more advanced, and I don't want to say in tune with nature, because I feel like the wild elves might be in tune with nature, but you know what, they're, I don't know, they're just more advanced than the wild elves, and they're more like a bridge, I'd say, between nature and man. The, the high elf and then there's the dark elves oh we live underground we're brood we're evil uh, but are we really evil i don't know it depends i guess on what lore you're looking at 
not too familiar with the Celtic mythology, but I believe they were innately evil. Like it was uh, something that was in their spirit, kind of like, you know, a demon or a devil. They were just there to cause mischief and problems and to uh, cause pain and misery. Whereas, oh, geez, this is loading. It's not working. Whereas the other elves weren't. Um, and in Dungeons and Dragons, it's like they were forced there. Well, in the Forgotten Realms, I can't say as a whole. Uh, they were forced underground through some type of war. And their minds have become twisted over time. And they want to kill uh, surface dwellers. But they're also very selfish. And I feel like their society is counterintuitive. It's like they're always backstabbing each other and killing each other and whatnot. And I feel like they're just... I would, I would like to see them more as a Spartan society. You know, like survival of the fittest. We're concentrated on war. Uh... We don't fuck around, and we take no prisoners. Not like, oh, we're going to backstab, and we're so political, and I'm going to take your power, and I'm going to take your power, and I'm going to do this. It's just, I don't know, it's not interesting to me. I feel like it's too counter counterintuitive. They would eventually all off themselves. There wouldn't really be any organization. Um, just, I, I don't know, I don't feel like it just wouldn't work. Maybe it would. There's probably some examples of real-world countries out there that work like that. But for how long, you know? I just, I don't know, especially for practically immortal beings, I just don't see it working. So, that's an example of, you know, sub-races and such. So now, let's get down to what I am going to offer, or not what I'm going to offer, but what I'm considering for my fantasy setting. So, for right now, I'm going to have the Alfar, which are just like elves. It's the Icelandic word, the old Celtic, or it might be the old Celtic word for elf. So, it's just nothing fancy, but I like, I just want something different, you know. And you're wondering, well, how are my elves different? One, uh, oh, and by the way, um, the setting is going to be Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition based. I'm going to be using that as a template for the tool set. Um, kind of like the Lord of the Rings book that I have, uh, Adventures of Middle-Earth, uses 5th edition as the base for the rules, and then they brought the Lord of the Rings role-playing game to life. I am planning on doing that with this setting. Um, so it will have, borrow a lot from traditional fantasy, but I'm going to make things somewhat my own while using that as a template. So anyway, the Alfar, they're going to be kind of like your perfect beings. Um, they're not going to be like, oh, you're, you know, your quick, nimble, dexterous characters. I, I, I don't get where that ever came from. I never understood that. Like when I mean, when I was first, first introduced to the game when I was 13, I didn't ask too many questions because I wasn't too familiar with fantasy, you know. Uh, like I discovered Dungeons and Dragons before I discovered. Lord of the Rings, which is weird, because I did a book report on The Hobbit when I was uh, in sixth grade, so I was probably 11 or 12, but I wasn't too familiar with, you know, The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings and everything that it continued on to. I wasn't familiar with that whatsoever. I was just familiar with The Hobbit, and I saw the cartoon movie and such, and that was it. So, but anyway, as I got older... You know, you learn about the elves, and they're like these, or they're supposed to be, these like immortal beings. Uh, they're supposed to have pretty much decent everywhere. Uh, no, their stats aren't going to be superior. Um, you know, they're not going to just have like a minimum of like 12 or 14 on everything. No, it's, that's not the case. Uh, there will be ways that I will try to display their uh, genetic superiority. Um in game, it's going to be mechanical, but they're not going to have your plus two to decks that you traditionally see. Um, but yeah, they will. We'll say they're just, you know, they're they're decent at everything. There, there'll be a way I'll I'll show you folks that. And of course, for sub races, I like their traditional sub races. I like the high Alfar, the wild Alfar, and the dark Alfar, 
like Jock Dolls and Jerry Hall. You know, that's. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Crap. Excuse me. You know what? Let me delete that. There we go. So then you have your dwarves. I'm br yes, I'm bringing the dwarves in. No special name. Uh. Oh, you know what? I forgot humans. They're important. They're going to be in the setting. Yes, because we can all relate. Humans. Gnomes. My favorite gnome. David the gnome. Anyone remember that uh, TV show? Little cartoon. He's got the little red hat. He's riding through the forest. I can't remember what creature he was on. Was it a rabbit or a badger? I can't remember. If you remember, put it in the comments. And if you see this video at a later date, put it in the YouTube comments. Uh, but yes. Gnome toutlings. I don't want to call them halflings, and I don't want to call them hobbits. Hobbits would be copyright infringement, and halflings is overused. Plus, I know toutling sounds a little weird, but they'll be slightly familiar with uh, enough familiarity with enough difference, I feel. It's basically a halfling, but their feet aren't going to be large and hairy. No. Think of... A proportionally smaller human. Right? There you go. Toutling. Munchkin. I always wanted this to be a race when uh, when I was younger. Um, I remember playing Dungeons and Dragons. I heard about someone was being a munchkin. I didn't know what that meant. And I thought it was a race at the time. And I got excited. And I was like, whoa, whoa I never heard of these munchkins. Tell me about them. I want to learn more, you know? And then I learned what it was, and I got disappointed. I was like, oh, it's just someone who's just so good at the rules and uses it to their advantage that they suspend the disbelief. <laughs> and I, I remember the picture in the player's handbook at the time, too. It was a guy in plate mail, second edition I'm talking about, by the way. He's holding a sword over his head like this, and he's got like, I don't know if he has eight, but he has like, I'll say he has eight arrows in his chest. And he should be dead. But because the guy is a munchkin or whatever, and uh, not the guy, but the, the player is a munchkin, he, um, he was able to survive something that should have killed his character. And so from that day forward, I was like, oh, I want munchkin to be a race. And you're probably wondering, all right, well, what's a munchkin? And how is it going to be different? You know, how's it going to be different than anything that's available? Well, that I don't know yet. Yeah, take that answer. I don't know. Screw you. <laughs> Screw you. <laughs> I just want munchkins, damn it. And uh, brownies, too. If you ever watch Willow the movie, the little guys, little pixie guys, I think they were called brownies. I always wanted characters called brownies. Um, but I decided to move away from the brownie name because a lot of people think it's food. And that's not going to work. Munchkins won't be the brownies, by the way. Ooh, that's a good idea. Could get No, but I already have a small race. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Then there's the Dagolith. These are going to be your traditional, like, large men. Your giant men. I don't mean, like, men 9, 10, 12 feet tall. You know, I'm, I'm talking about, like, your 7, 8 footers. Uh, things you might have heard, like, Native American myth. Um, though they might have had giants too, but I'm just talking about like just your large men. That's 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 the Dagolith. Um, they're going to be giant, bulky creatures. I'm thinking of three sub races for them. You're going to have your feral ones, which if you ever see Blanca from like Street Fighter, uh, think of him, but without the green skin, normal skin tone, you know, like normal flesh tones. <laughs> so you know, like whatever flesh tones are available to humans. That's what a Dagolith will have. It's not going to have green skin and orange fur. Uh, the hair, though, like on the males for the feral ones, it's going to come down kind of like a mane. It's going to like bush out on the head, right? Come down. And it's going to like come down on the jaw. It's not going to mustache. It's not like a beard. It's going to come down on the lower jaw, mantle down onto the chest, onto the shoulders, and onto the back, right? On the females, it's going to just come down off of the the head there and a little bit on, her sh on their shoulders. Um, that's going to be the feral ones. They're going to have 
claws, not like a cat. They're not going to be retractable, but their nails are going to be like, you know, claw-like. They're going to be sharp. They're going to have pointed teeth. Um, think of like, you know, like a half giant man, like half wolf creature. Kind of like that, except for it's natural. It's not like magic. Um, then there's going to be, I believe, the stone walls. That's what I named the other ones. They're going to be a race that, this is where I draw upon Native American lore. Uh, they rub stone into their skin, and they start from childbirth. Like, they rub the s small stones into the baby's flesh, and what it does is it, like, tears away the flesh a little, and they leave the stones there, and the stones become a part of the creature's flesh. You know, like, the flesh will grow over it, the, the, the flesh will callous and harden, and the stones will become a part of it. And as they get older, the stones get bigger and bigger, and they rub stones into their flesh, and it kind of wears their flesh away. Uh, but you know, they'll have that appearance of like, and this is, this is like a circumstantial racial feature here, because what if they never rub those stones in their flesh? Their flesh isn't naturally going to be hard. All right. This is a circumstantial one. This is just what they do as a, uh, as like part of their culture too, you know, this particular group of Dagolith. Um, and you'll see like, you know, what they'll look like is they will be like blotches of stone around on the flesh with, with like flesh, like kind of like thrown over and through it. It'll be very calloused. They'll have a natural armor class, uh, type of thing. And then of course there's just your traditional Dagolith. They'll be your, like, you're just vanilla, uh, large man type of person. And, uh, I really like them. I think they're, they're cool, you know? Uh, drew, I'm not going to lie, I drew a little inspiration, not only from um, lore talking about the giant men and things like that, but seeing, um, you know, the Goliath in D&D 3.5, uh, Andre the Giant, you know, people like him, um, but instead of being human, they're going to be their own thing, um, but I, I just like the concept of, hey, this guy's not exactly large size mechanic wise, but I mean, if you looked at him, you know, like, oh, he's, he's large, you know, like as, as just a word, he's like seven foot four and like 500 pounds. Holy crap. He can bench press this wagon over here. He can throw that horse, you know, um, that always, that always made me, uh, excited. So anyway, enough of that. So what do we have? We're down to seven, all right? Yes. Okay. Next up, orcs. I like orcs. I want them to be a present playable race. Goblins. Oh yeah, of course, right? You can't have it. Kobolds. Oh, why are they doing this once I get to 10? You notice that? Kobolds. Uh, hmm. What else? Yep. Edigal. They're going to be a race of magical beings that live, well, long thought to have been extinct, but live inside the planet. Um, elemental beings, kind of. M mostly probably resemble elemental elves. Uh, bald, they don't grow hair whatsoever. You know, I, li I like them. Need to expand upon them a little bit, but. And anything that can't be totally fleshed out will be discarded, but this is just kind of the idea right now. Then we have the Dwethelic. They're very... They're oriented in one section of the planet. Um, they have a northernmost continent, and they live up there. It's kind of as guardians of a particular area on the planet. Um... And what a Dwethelic might be is I want you to picture if you took, like, what you picture as an elf and you picture as a dwarf and you mash them together, you know what I mean? Uh, genetically, their genes wouldn't be half elf, half dwarf, you know? Uh, it would be its own creature, but I want you to kind of picture that for what it would look like. It's going to be this slightly shorter, stockier uh, being with, like, pointy and bulbous -y features at once. It's going to have, like, slightly pointed ears with, like, you know, bulbous -y nose, uh, patchy, bushy facial hair, 
because they all far in my world. They uh, they can't grow blotty hair or things like that. Um, that's one thing I forgot to mention. Like the the hair they can grow aside from their head and their eyebrows and eyelashes. Uh, for the men is the pubis area and the armpits, and for the females the pubis area and uh, that's it. You know, that's that's the I want the alpha. The uh, dwarf leg won't really have that problem. Um, they'll be mildly hairy. They're not going to be super hairy. They'll be mildly hairy. Dwarves will be ones that are hairy. You know, they'll be like, oh, they can grow thick fur. Like, you see how hairy my arm is right here? Like, a Dwethelic would have less than that. This is probably like a dwarf amount, give or take a little. Orcs, extremely hairy. You know what I mean? Orcs could, like, grow a lot of hair. <laughs> Orcs could be hairy. Goblins? Eh, I don't know. They could probably be hairy, too. Gnomes can grow hair on the tips of their nose and ears. But enough of that. Uh, yeah, so Dwethelic. Just picture the physical features of a, of a dwarf and an elf kind of like merged. And they're like special guardians. So. And then there's the Fagrith. These are my small little race. These guys are like six inches tall. This is what I decided to make the brownies. Because you know how I said I always wanted the brownies? These are the brownies right here. Mm -mm -mm, this is the dessert. <laughs> All right. Not literally, they're my six inch tall guys, and you're wondering, well, how do they fit in? How could a player character possibly be one of those realistically? Uh, and make it seem feasible to uh, injure someone. I guess the way I see it is since they're very small, and I guess it only works for certain types of weapons um, mechanically. I couldn't see them doing it with like a hammer, but I see them seeing like the imperfections, the openings for an attack. So, say for example, you got your little six-inch Fagrith, right? He's like, he's like right here on the table, and here I'm sitting in plate mail, right? He'll have the same normal attack, the same normal damage, and you're wondering, well, how? You know, he's got a little sword like this big. You know, how how's he gonna do that? Uh, the way I picture it is, he sees the opening in the plate mail. He's able to jab, or he or her, you know, uh, the Fagrith, um, is able to jab the sword up into that spot. And just drags it along, or like, say for example, the Fagrith sees a, uh, like, you know, all, like there's a big juicy vein right here. You know, they hop on the back of their, oh, see, this is a piece of lure. Um, Fagriths, upon birth, are bonded with a sugar glider type creature that they use and that lives with them throughout their life. It's their bonded animal companion that they have from birth. And uh, it becomes a life partner for them. So every figure will have one of these. Uh, I mean, you know, if it dies, it dies. You don't get a new one. It sucks to be you. You know, it's part of your character. <laughs> it's 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 something that comes with you. You automatically have that with you. But anyway, um, so you know, they get on their little sugar glider creature and just picture it r like running up a character's arm and slicing a big juicy vein causes a big gash you know and this is bleeding out that's that's an example of the 1d8 damage the blade is small but it caused such a big thing because it was able to cut through its move action you know i don't see it like hammers i feel like blunt uh, blunt weapons are the ones because like what's it really going to do you can't cut with a blunt weapon you can't pierce with a, a blunt weapon you know is it, this is going to hit like just the perfect the perfect little spot to stop the blood flow or to uh <laughs> to um to break the bone you know like i don't know Mechanically, they're a little, uh, they'll need some work. Maybe I should lower the damage. I don't know. But I, I kind of don't want to. You know, I don't want to, like, eh, but then again, they are small, so they could have their benefits. I, I, th I guess if you have certain benefits that you throw, like, if, if you if you do a small creature, like, all right, here's my six-inch being. How can I make this good for the player, but also make it seem realistic? How can I make this fun for the player? That's one thing D&D 3.5, well, 3, 3.5, and, like, Pathfinder did. They did size differences. Oh, you know, you get plus two attack and armor class, and you can uh, you can hide better, but your damage is, is nothing, you know. Uh, you do, like, one damage or something like that. You have a lower damage die. Um, the way I might represent it is they might have disadvantage on damage. Might just roll normal damage, but a disadvantage. So, for example, if they have like a weapon that's a 1d12, let them roll the 1d12, whatever. 
or I don't know they wouldn't be able to because it would have a heavy feature. So I could probably still put that on there. And uh, then again, they would roll that at disadvantage normally. The attack, but yeah, damage. The way the way it would work would be all right. You, you get your one d twelve, but roll two d twelve. Take the worst of it. You know that that might help out. So it's still kind of fun. You could damage, but it sucks because you're always doing less. The magic. Well, at least the spells are a manifestation of power, and they don't matter what size your creature is. They'll just, you know, boom. That's it. Which I always think is weird. I don't get that. Like you get the okay, you get the six inch Fagrith, generates as much power, manifests as much magic as like let's say a twenty foot giant. Like, I don't get it. Like he's harnessing all this power and bringing it. Just picture Goku, right? When he does the spirit bomb, you know, when he lifts his arms up like this and you can see the energy flowing into him. Now, picture the six inch Fagrith doing that and a twenty foot giant. And they're getting the same siphon of energy into them to produce that fireball. Seems silly, right? I mean, I can understand, I guess, from a mechanical standpoint, because you don't want to make special rules for every spell for every size type. But it does seem odd to me that something could generate the same magic missile, the same fireball, the same big, big B hand. You know what I mean? Like, th this little six inch figure is going to have a large hand. And, you know, and this giant. Is gonna have the same size hand, big B hand that the Fagrith has. <laughs> Just doesn't doesn't make sense to me. But I could see for mechanical reasons why it would be done, because it would be it's easier. You know, it's less work on the dungeon master, less work on the players, and it's just it's cleaner. You know, it's more clean, more efficient, better oil in the machine. Um, so I can understand it from a game design point, you know, point of view. So enough of the Fagrith. Oh, and Fagrith and Sugar Glider Companion. That's their lure. Right? And they come with that automatic animal companion friend. Bonus friendship for everyone. So what is up? You're probably thinking, damn, how many more races is this jerk going to have? I forgot about the Hurlians. They're my forearmed race. And you're, you know, you're probably pretty familiar with forearm creatures right um they're like human like tall not as big as the dagolith but tall uh i want you to picture like goro from mortal Kombat, kentaro shiva except for they won't have the tiger stripes um these are going to be very uh greek mythology based for me though they're going to have that type of feel uh if you ever play age of mythology you know like the um those the Gigantes, they have the forearms, you know, something similar to that, you know, not, well, human-like with forearms. They'll be tall, you know, they'll be they'll be tall, but not Daigle with tall. Hurlians, I'm excited. Forearm creatures, boom, they're they're like a fantasy trope staple. Uh, cat people, I like cat peoples. Pershines, that's what I'm calling my cats. Purrs, and you know, the cat's purring, and sheen is in the sheen of their coat. The shine. Duh. Uh, dog people. I don't know what I want to name my dog people. What do I want to name my dog people, folks? Tell me. Tell me in the comments below. And you know the ordeal if you're watching this on YouTube, which you might be, because I doubt there's anyone in here. Let me look. Ah, oh, crap. It's, it doesn't tell me. Well, if anyone's in here, tell me. <laughs> I, will, I will go t and read the chat. Nope, it does not say. So anyway, for now we'll call the dog people gnolls. Oh yeah, that's right. Let me put cat people. <gasps> dog people. Four-armed people. Oh yes, I forgot lizard folk. Ratkin. See, I like certain Animorphs. I don't want to go totally crazy with the Animorphs, but I do like them to an extent. And I know that some people love Animorphs, and that's fine. You can. You can have an Animorph for almost every type of creature. You can have a spider Animorph, a monkey Animorph, a whale Animorph, a shark Animorph, a turtle Animorph, a uh, fish Animorph. 
you know? And that's the thing, an insect anamorph. Well, would it really be an anamorph if it was an insect? I don't know, an avian anamorph. Then again, would it still be an anamorph? See, these are questions we must ask ourselves to answer. So anyway, enough of this joking. That's uh, serious right there. The Persians, the gnolls, the lizard folk, and the ratkin. That is, uh, is that 18? Ooh, wow. Uh, da, 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 da. Let me switch. Let me take a look real quick. Oh, wait, get out of here. Um, all right, that's still up. Perfect. Ah, uh, here we go. I'm just checking one of my folders. Don't mind me. I just want to make sure I got everything. Oh, okay. I forgot a few, a few of them. So, ogres. I like ogres. Trolls. I know some of these might seem redundant to you. Well, why is there an ogre if there's a Dagolith? You know? Trolls. Uh, half races? And the way my half races are going to work, it's not going to be uh, like your traditional game where there's half orc or half elf. Um, you pick both halves. There's going to be a compatibility chart that will let you know if the two races can breed and produce offspring. And if so, you choose features. Uh, it'll be a set number of features from each race. So, for example, let's say we're going to take a dwarf and an orc. <coughs> Those babies must be ugly. <laughs> oh, God. All right, I want you to picture that first of all. Picture a dwarf and an orc, and they had a baby. <sighs> what, the, what does it look like? All right, so what, you, what you're going to do is you're going to take the statistical increases. So say a dwarf gets constitution, right? And it's a plus two. You're going to have that. Take the plus one. Put it on your half character. Let's say the orc gets a plus two to strength. Right? You're going to have that. Put that plus one. And put it on the strength. And let's say they have some plus ones now. Let's say the dwarf has a plus one wisdom and the orc has a plus one con. Um, you can discard those plus ones. Just get rid of them. You know? Uh... Or it might be a little cleaner. I might do something else, but I'm thinking of doing that for now. And then, like, let's say there's a certain number of racial features, right? Boom. Let's say the dwarf has, I don't know, like five to pick from, and the orc has three. Uh, well, you got to choose this. You, you combine them, right? Eight. You have eight features there. But you got to choose the same amount from each one. Um, and four features, let's say. You got to choose four features. So, for example, all right, I choose this from the dwarf, I choose this from the dwarf. All right, now I choose this from the orc, and I choose this from the orc. Bam. That's my half orc, half, half dwarf. You choose the better of both visions. So, say, for example, there's normal vision, and then there's dark vision. You would add dark vision to the character. Uh, it would have dark vision. It would inherit the better gene. Um, languages. Now, I'm going to do languages a little different in my game. There are going to be regional languages, country languages. That's how it's going to work. It's going to be setting-based, so it's going to be based on the country. Some races, however, may carry their own language. Um, so that might be a thing. It depends. Some races may not have their own language. So I'll be there. But let's say there are racials. Let's say there is a dwarven language and there is an orc language. It'll know both languages. It will know both dwarven and orcish and it would know how to read and write in both of them um, now height and weight would actually be the average median between the two which could get a little fuzzy so like let's say orcs can be up to like six and a half feet tall and dwarves can be up to five foot tall it'd be somewhere in the middle you know it'd be like all right well you're gonna be around five and a half to six feet tall uh and since dwarves are stocky and orcs are large the weight would be somewhere it would be definitely a stocky build Size, you know, the size is always going to be the middle. If it's a, if it's normally like a small creature, like let's say a uh, a gnome with like an orc, and it would bump it up from a small to the next size category, go to that next size category. Uh, do not remain small. You know, I don't know. That's that's what I'm going to do. I think things should work out. Skin, hair, and eye color, 
can you can have choice from either sides uh, for hair or eye color and for the skin tone I would say maybe a blend you know if you don't want to do a blend pick one of the skin tones but uh, I'd, I'd say a blend so say like you the orcs have like green skin we'll go with green skin orcs right and the dwarf has a nice bronze skin uh, you know t get a sheet of paper and mix a little bronze and a little green you know maybe be like a little green tinge on the bronze or something like that and that's kind of like what this character's skin tone would look like now I just picture this in your mind close your eyes so subtly and be like wow that is the ugliest dwarfling I've ever seen it's got like gnarly black hair and it's got like a green tint to its skin and those tusks coming out of its lower jaws are jutting it's just coming out like this it's got the tusks coming right up you know it's got that flat nose but it's kind of like rounded right here in the tip and its ears are like big and round with like a slight point and it's, it's got this big, nappy, black beard that comes down. It's just big. It's just so nappy. It's the orc's hair is unkempt, you know? And it's got, like, yellow, crusty nails. It almost feel like it could just grow wild. And uh, the thing's about five foot seven we're talking about. It's about... 200 pounds <laughs> you know like that's what I'm picturing and it's just it's disturbing not bad disturbing just like weird disturbing you know so those are the possibilities uh, with my half and half system um, I came up with the system back in 2011 when I was trying to make an offshoot of 3.5 for my own game and I was calling it 3.75 as a joke and then I later called it labyrinths and liches uh, but I decided to, this is a cleaner system, and I'm going to carry a lot of what I've been doing over. Um, but half races isn't where it ends. There is also Mongrel, which is going to be your mix of races. This is where you have a bunch of mixes of character traits in you. Uh, a Mongrel might typically have plus one to three separate stats of your choice. And then you might be able to pick, like, I don't know, five different features from all different races, but only one feature per race to kind of represent your mixed heritage. Like, you're, you're just a mutt, you know? Like, maybe you have uh, dwarf, elf, orc, human, and gnome in you, you know what I mean? And that, that, that's your character. It doesn't have to be five. Uh, that's just an example. And then um, the last race, yes, wow, is that 23? That is a lot. We'll call them a constructed one. You know, the living golem type. Be nice to have. People like those. They're cool. They have a lot of mystique about them. Trolls, though. I like the trolls. Trolls are cool. Trolls can mate with anything. Oh, yeah. Trolls. I kind of picture them like gremlins, you know? Uh, not all the trolls, but just the way it works. Like, if, if, if the troll, if you mate with the troll, the way it works is it starts growing all those, like, foamy little bubbles on it, and then they start hatching into the, the, the babies. Uh, but the troll will always have features, like, of what it bred with if it's not another troll. So if it bred with a squirrel, you know, if it's like... Right? And next, you know, the baby comes out, bloop! Right, there's a little troll baby. Uh, <laughs> it, it, not only would it have the troll features, but it might have like you know little whiskers in the side and little, little squirrel teeth, you know. Oh, and if the troll breeds with like, if the troll is the one, oh, and all the trolls by the way are both sexes in, in my world. Trolls are not one sex. They can either get you pregnant or get pregnant. All right, that's how the trolls work. They're all, what's the, what's the, what was it, what was it called? I can't call it bisexual. What would it be called? Oh, jeez. I don't know. If someone knows, tell me. Dual sexual? We'll call it dual sexual until uh, someone has a better term for me, if there is a better term. 
But just imagine the same troll getting a squirrel pregnant if it was with a female squirrel, right? Then the fate for that thing is terrible. Just picture alien, right? Just bursting right out of it. Like, you know, once the due date's done, I mean, I don't mean right away. Uh, the babies would all just burst out of it. Um, how many babies does a troll have? I, I don't know. Depends on the troll. <laughs> I have a few different types of trolls. I have garden trolls, which are my small little trolls. Uh, they're pretty cool. I like them. They have photosynthesis. Or they can, anyway. Um, they're the ones that are probably more common. And then I have the uh, the big, burly, like, mountain troll. You know, it's just like just this wall. Uh, can they mate with everything? Yeah, but would you really want to? Well, I, for one with a troll to begin with, the answer is probably not. But the big burly mountain troll is like, oh, wow, the thing's going to rip you in half. You know? Don't want to with the mountain troll. It's going to kill you. Yeah. Let's not talk about that anymore. Let's talk about the squirrel that's going to be having the babies rip out of it. That's the... Uh, it's a disturbing sight. That's the trolls, man. Like, that's what they do. Yeah. Oh, everything. They're just like this little scourge, you know? They can, they can just do it with everything. However, the troll blood becomes less pure and pure, you know, which affects their regeneration ability. So, any troll that's not a full troll doesn't have as an efficient of a regeneration ability. And there's very few bloodlines of troll that are pure troll. Um, but yeah, those are the trolls. So we're going to put, can mate with anything. And I don't mean anything as in like a chair leg, you know, a flower. Oh, maybe a flower. Uh, you know, like a, a bottle of Pepsi. You know, I don't mean stuff like that. I mean stuff that can produce offspring, you know. That's, oh, hold on, I got a YouTuber. Oh, someone liked one of my comments. Well, good for them. Thank you. So let's review the list. 23, it's an ambitious number. And that's not even including any sub-races that might be present in some of these. So ambition can be chopped down. Oh, evening, thank you for joining me, by the way. Unless you've already left, then at that part, I am sorry for not getting back to you sooner. And if you do enjoy uh, this, please follow. Oh, I've been rambling for over an hour, haven't I? Ooh. I think we've gotten the point, right? So let's, let's go back over what we were talking about. Real quick to recap. Races to consider. Traditional fantasy, human only. Traditional fantasy, not human, or outworldly. And then the features, we've gone into genetic, and here's a list of some examples. Are, uh, are they purely mechanical, or are they just aesthetic? Like, they just, some looks circumstantial. Like one of the things I talked about earlier with the dagolith that rubs the stones into its flesh, that would be a circumstantial uh, feature. You know, one of the circumstance of them rubbing stones into the flesh, causing them to look and... Uh, have those types of features. So these, I feel, are purely mechanical. And then there's a list of how to change them and so on and so on. Physical as an appearance, yep, see, and just a reiteration. And then internal, things that are inside. Um, you know, larger brain, two hearts, uh, one giant lung, things like that. So, if we come back down here, 23 potential uh, races at least for this setting here and each not each race but each race has the potential to have sub races 23 it's a decent number but I've been rambling for a while this has been going for quite a bit and until next time and I hope this worked out I hope you enjoyed and if you catch us on YouTube, please check out the Twitch channel. Uh, I'm going to try to do these every Friday if I don't run into any problems or have any plans. Next week, we're going to go over classes, what classes you're going to have uh, you want to have available in your setting for your character, and how to determine what classes you might want. 
So thank you for joining me, and I'll see you next time. That's where I hit the entry button. That's where you, that's where you can uh, log off. Oh, you want me to log off? Okay, fine. I'll do it. Good night, everyone.